Welcome to the third and final day of the Warwick Economic Summit. My name is Jack Jones and I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Nynham. Mr Nynham is a founding member of the Stop the War Coalition and is also an author. Thank you for joining us today. No, it's all good to be here. So I'd like to begin with the historic march against the Iraq War in 2003, in which two million people turned out to protest. However, the campaign against the war was dismissed by most MPs and the Blair government. So, in your view, what did the protest achieve? Well, I mean, obviously it was disappointing, I think, for many of the people involved and for us that actually we didn't manage to stop uh, British participation in the war. I think we possibly came closer than some um, would have you believe, though, because if you read some of the memoirs the sort of behind the scenes in Whitehall and Downing Street at the time, there was absolute pandemonium. Uh, and actually, the Foreign Secretary, Jeff Hoon, phoned his counterpart in Washington just shortly before the war, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, and, that, and said, look, we may not be able to participate because there is so much opposition. So, you know, it came quite close to being decisive. But obviously, it wasn't. But I think you've got to say that although we didn't stop the war, we definitely, we and wider public and all who participated, created a situation in Britain where now... It's very, very difficult for a government to even contemplate any kind of serious foreign military intervention. And I think it would, it's correct to say that um, if the British government now tried to you know, get 30,000 or 40,000 troops to go to the Middle East, it just wouldn't be able to because the level of opposition would be so great. The other thing we did is I think we, we fatally damaged the reputation of Tony Blair. Partly he did that himself by lying to the public by championing and um, uh, uh, helping to organise the disastrous war. But I think the mobilisation of public opinion on the streets, which wasn't just one demo, but a whole string of demonstrations and protests and school student strikes and so forth, I think they had a very, very serious impact. So we're now in a situation in Britain where every time the government considers the possibility of supporting another US-led foreign intervention, they're going to be nervous about public opinion and about protest. And that's, you know, that's something, that's progress. So, of course, the Middle East is once again on the minds of politicians. I'm, of course, referring to the situation in Iran, where tensions last month very much escalated, but have now uh, since calmed down. What parallels do you know between the situation in Iran and the Iraq war? Well, I mean, I think the parallels are there, and I think they're quite alarming. You know, we have... Uh, a US government that is very much promoting the idea that, you know, the, uh, the government in Iran is the threat to peace and stability in the region, which is exactly what they said about Saddam Hussein. Um, they're ramping up the pressure against the Iranian government by imposing absolutely brutal sanctions, which are causing real suffering uh, in the wider population in Iran, which is exactly what they did in the run up to war uh, in Iraq. Um, there's a kind of general propaganda offensive against the uh, Iranian people. And of course, there's all these provocative acts. There's the, first of all, the scrapping or the unilateral withdrawal by the US from the JCPOA nuclear agreement. There's the um, various missile strikes. There's the, obviously the drone attack, the assassination of General Soleimani a few weeks ago. These are acts of war, to be honest. And I am very frightened that we could be in a situation whether it's in the next few weeks or the next few months, where we have another war in the Middle East, which is why the anti-war movement is doing its absolute utmost to mobilise people against it. Thank you. So I'm interested to know, as 17 years have passed since the campaign against the Iraq war, how do you think protesting has evolved um, or adapted to our times, especially in the age of social media? Um, I mean, obviously, quite a lot has changed. And... Um, you know, I think social media is, you know, clearly the most obvious example of that, and I think it is very important. And we only had e we had emails actually in two thousand and two, two thousand and three, uh, but none of the rest of it. And you know, this in some ways it's a big advantage because you are in a position where you can kind of very, very quickly disseminate um, information and calls for protests. You've seen that in Hong Kong, especially as well. Saw that in Hong Kong. I mean, seeing it in a whole range of protest movements around the world at the moment. However, I mean, I think it's got to be said there is a potential downside, which is that I think um, there can be a tendency for activists to downplay the importance of real-world networking and real-world organising 
and actually face-to-face -face contact with activists and interactions that go beyond the kind of soundbite that you get on Instagram or or um, or picture you get on Instagram or um, or Twitter. You know, I mean, there's a kind of obviously a, the danger of a kind of slightly superficial and impressionistic approach to things, which doesn't actually lead to sustained organisation necessarily. So, you know, we very much do try and organise groups on the ground in every town and city and university that actually do meet and discuss things in depth, but also think about how you how you network in the real world, as well as um, putting out the calls on Facebook. So on balance, do you think that social media has had a net positive impact or a net negative impact? I think it's very difficult to say, because in the end of the day, you know, technology always moves forward and it, it creates advantages for the movement, but also there are advantages from the point of view of the the other side as well, and they can always spend more money than we can. So I don't think there is a technological fix to organising. You have to adapt and you have to be as creative. And I think sometimes the movement gets ahead of the game um, when it comes to social media and or when it comes to a new technology. Sometimes the government and the establishment manage to uh, undermine that or move ahead. Could I you think, provide an example? Um, well, I mean, I think an example might be the the contrast between the 2017 and 2019 elections, actually. I think in 2017, I think Corbyn's Labour Party actually and Momentum actually had a kind of very organic um, social media operation that had a big reach and had a big sense of identification, which for one reason or other, I think they lost in 2019 and the Tories spent a huge amount of money and they kind of, they learned their lesson from 2017, they spent a huge amount of money, they spent uh, a lot more time on social media. I think, I'm not sure that they didn't win the social media operation in the 2019 election. So that's just one example. Um, but I mean, more generally, there's the issue of, you know, in whose hands are you when you're on social media, really? You know, they're run by big cor multinational corporations who aren't inherently very sympathetic to social movements. So you've always got to remember when you use these platforms that, you know, they're vulnerable to um, uh, censorship, even in the case of extreme uh, situations of crisis, as we're seeing in different parts of the world, they're, they're vulnerable to closing, you know, to closure, complete closure, shutdown. So, you know, there's, there's, it's not quite as simple as sometimes people make out that we've got a big, you know, um, massive advantage when it comes to the social media question. So you mentioned there the general election. I would now like to turn to party politics and specifically your connection to the Labour Party. You are yourself, of course, a close ally of Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the outgoing Labour leader. The Labour Party, as I'm sure you're aware, suffered their worst election defeat in 80 years. Many reasons have been given as to why. What is most striking is the NEC report, which effectively exonerated Mr Corbyn of any blame instead pointing to Brexit as the most important factor in the outcome of the election. Mr Nynham, in your opinion, does Jeremy Corbyn deserve any of the blame? No, I don't think he does, actually. Um, I mean, I'm not a Labour Party member, but uh, I am, as you say, I support Jeremy. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn was the, actually the chair of the Stop the Wall Coalition before he became the leader of the Labour Party. Um, and, you know, I very much support his basic political stances. Um, and I think, you know, I think the obvious evidence for that is that the, the contrast between 2017 and 2019, you know, the, essentially the politics was the same. The leader was the same. In 2017, it was the best result. Um, it was the biggest surge Labour has had since 1945. Uh, in 2019, it certainly wasn't the worst election result for 80 years. Actually, uh, Labour... In terms of seats won in Parliament, it was. Yeah, but in terms of votes, which in many ways is a better indicator... The seat actually... is the most important, though. Well, it really is the agree. most important, but, I mean, on the question of public opinion, you know, we're talking about whether um, uh, the... Um, the progressive policies of Jeremy Corbyn lost public opinion. And actually, in terms of public opinion, in terms of the popular vote, he did better than Ed Miliband in 2015. He did better than um, Gordon Brown in 2010. He actually did comparably to Tony Blair in 2005. So, so I, I think the big difference, you've got to say, what is the difference between those two results? One, a very, very impressive result. One, a very, very poor result. Two years. What is the main difference? I think two actually main differences. One is the position on the Brexit vote. That was a fundamental switch, which I think was perceived as a, an act of, you know, um, an undemocratic move, 
they went from Labour went from um, saying they're going to respect the results of the referendum to saying they're going to have a second um, a second vote, a second referendum, and actually appeared pretty much to be a Remain party, even though Jeremy himself desperately tried to stop that happening. The right really, really forced him into a position of saying, you know, that we're going to be Remainers, basically. And that was, I mean, all the evidence shows that was an absolute catastrophe for Labour. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I think, that in that period of two years, the establishment uh, kind of having been taken rather by surprise by the 2017 election result, uh, really did an operation on the Labour Party and they, they, they mobilised all sorts of, they kind of demonised Jeremy himself and really attacked the progressive politics, but particularly by the, uh, in my view, a largely, uh, almost entirely false uh, accusations of anti-Semitism in the party. They created a real, uh, a real kind of confusion around that in people's minds. And actually, I, this is something I do blame the Corbyn leadership for, in the sense that they didn't push back en uh, enough against that. I mean, the idea that Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite is it's a ludicrous idea. He's had the most consistent um, anti-racist uh, record of any, including on anti-Semitism, of any politician in the whole of Parliament. So, I mean, you know, there should have been more of a pushback against what was a very, very kind of concerted right-wing attack on the Corbyn project, because the, the establishment were very scared. Are they... They don't want inequality to be addressed. They certainly don't want a prime minister, or didn't want a prime minister, who is against the foreign wars they've been pursuing, is against you know nuclear uh, first strike uh, or pushing the nuclear button, is uh, has very serious reservations against, about NATO and so forth. You know, I think what happened is the establishment got its act together uh, and did a very good job of of. Um, of undermining him and demonising him, and that played its part as well. But I would, I do think the Brexit question was the central problem for Labour. Do you think perhaps um, the media's image of Jeremy Corbyn as well contributed to, to the outcome of the election? Definitely, definitely. You know, I mean, I think there's no doubt about it. There was all sorts of lies and um, half-truths being circulated. There was the, you know, I think it's not just the media. There was a collaboration between the media and sections of the civil service and the security services you know he was uh, a security risk he was the civil service were um, circulating ideas that were promoted on the bbc and in the guardian and other places about him being you know too old and maybe having mental health issues and all of these kind of questions that were that were circulated there's absolutely no doubt you look at the academic research into what the media said and and how they um how they dealt with Corbyn, and there was a huge bias against him, particularly, actually, I mean, you know, in a way, people would expect that in the Daily Mail and the Express and the, uh, and the Telegraph and the Times and so forth. But in the, particularly the BBC and the Guardian, I think were, were guilty of a real, of a, of a kind of, not just the, the usual kind of instinctive um, uh, hostility towards left-wing seriously left-wing um, uh, politicians, but actually something a little bit more than that. I think there was a concerted campaign to try and demonise him. And so you were, you were very critical of the start of the Labour Party on a second referendum, I gather from what you said. Do you blame perhaps shadow cabinet ministers, Keir, Sir Keir Starmer comes to mind, for kind of pushing forward that agenda for the second referendum? Yes, very much. And not just Keir Starmer, actually. I mean... I think there was huge pressure in the in the shadow cabinet uh, from him and from others and from from it kind of brought together you know sections of the right of the party the Blairite right of the party with sections of the left actually who were kind of pro European sections of the left who who very much put pressure on and actually you know um, John McDonnell and even Diane Abbott in the end of the day succumbed to this pressure and then created a situation where Corbyn was very isolated and which was ridiculous because the position in 2017 was we'll respect the referendum uh, whatever anyone might think about the however anyone voted there was a kind of basically correct principle democratic position of respecting the outcome of the referendum but also saying we're going to have a, a people's Brexit a Brexit that benefit we're going to try and campaign for and implement a Brexit that actually benefits, you know, um, 
the, the ordinary people in Britain. And that was a very sensible position. It was sensible politically, and one of the effects it had was to mean that Brexit wasn't a big issue in the 2017 election. It couldn't be, because both of the main parties were going to go along with it. So it became a thing about what kind of Brexit, and actually that led you on to talking about wider policy. That didn't happen in 2019, because by that stage, Labour had a second referendum position, which had been foisted on Corbyn, as I say, Corbyn himself, and this speaks to the question of, do I blame Corbyn? Actually, I blame Corbyn least, because he did try and push back against that position. But ultimately, he wasn't successful. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, in the end of the day, that's, that's, not, his, that's not his fault. That was the position taken by the other sh shadow cabinet ministers and by... But, I mean, other... he is leader of the party, so shouldn't he have shown some leadership and perhaps stood up to them? Well, I think he tried, to be honest. I mean, maybe I would have preferred if he, from the very start, had said... Um, that he was whatever anyone else said, he was going to stick to his his position. But, you know, I can totally understand why he didn't do that. Well, if he tried, then he obviously didn't try very hard because, I mean, at the end of the day, he is the leader and the buck stops with him. And that wasn't their position. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, it's a Democratic Party, the Labour Party. At least you know, people might have some criticisms of the kind of democracy that it is. But basically, it was a conference decision and Jeremy put his argument... Um, and he lost it amongst the members. So I don't think you can blame him for losing. I think you can, you can, I think there's a, I think there's actually a kind of problem amongst a section of the left who didn't understand the importance of the democratic question. And whatever one might think about the European Union, in the end of the day, a left-wing party that is dismissive of the question of democracy um, is always going to face problems. And I think there was a severe underestimation amongst a number of different elements of the left in the Labour Party of, uh, of, of how, bad that would, how badly that would pan out. And I think a lot of people agree with that now, but unfortunately too many people have realised too late after the event what a disaster it was. It's interesting here that you say that a second referendum would be undemocratic. Of course, others would say that there's nothing undemocratic in having another vote. So what would be your response to that? Well, I mean, that's just not a tenable position because it was when the referendum was, when the first so referendum... Uh, so, for example, were people allowed to change their minds, do you think? But the, Should they be allowed to? People can change their minds, but, the, you know, when the referendum in 2016 was, uh, was organised, it was said this was going to be the decisive vote. You can't have a situation where the losing party in a decisive vote just says, well, we're not going to accept that result, we're going to rerun it. You know, if they'd said, if, if in the run-up to the referendum they said this was the first referendum and then once a deal has been uh, put together, we'll put it to another referendum, fair enough. But that's not what was said. So, you know, a democratic uh, conception, a kind of constitutional position that is put forward can't just be shredded. Because if it is, you end up with total chaos. Because what would be to stop, if there was a second referendum, what is there to stop people saying, well, you want a third referendum? I mean, you know, it's clearly nonsense, that argument. And the idea that, you know, in 2016, it was like the debate wasn't at a very high level. Well, that, again, is a kind of completely false justification because I don't believe that, actually, I don't believe that there'd be much more clarity about a referendum if there was a second vote now, to be honest with you. Um, so, no, I mean, I think those arguments are completely spurious and, and ridiculous, to be honest. I mean, if the situation had dramatically changed, I'm not saying that you couldn't, argue for a for another referendum you know down the road but nothing had changed fundamentally we hadn't even left you know so um all it, it all it was is a you know clearly it was a divisive vote and therefore for some reason you need to have another one and it and and it, and it was catastrophic really for for labor i think